Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Wheel of Mind, the Wheel of Time point of view reread podcast. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 7, where we have been reading Nynaeve Almira's points of view. I'm your co-host, Lajara Dane of the White Aja. Hi, and I'm Giskel Semaris, a scholar from Ilion. For any new listeners to our series, I want to remind you that the Wheel of Mind is an in-depth character reread podcast, and we may drop random spoilers at random times, so this right now is your only spoiler warning. Now, today we're examining The Fires of Heaven, Chapters 8 and 9. And I'll get us started with Chapter 8, entitled Over the Border. This chapter opens with Nynaeve bouncing in the back of a wagon, trying to reach the water barrel while keeping her the wind from blowing off her hat and trying to not stumble around and look like a fool. Tom is driving the wagon, and Elaine sits far too closely to him and fawns all over him. Julian Sandar rides on a horse near them, looking just as out of place on the animal as Nynaeve does in the wagon. The Panarch Armathera had given them gold and jewelry for their trip, and they were traveling posing as merchants, and had been trying to get out of the madness and anarchy of Terabon for nearly a month. Nynaeve reflects on a recent bandit attack, which happened off-page, and on how she had whipped up that dust storm to drive them away. There had been many such attempts along the road. Nynaeve was glad to see that her strength in the One Power was increasing as she used it, but she was no longer angry and right now couldn't even sense the source. Well, that was just as well, since Tom mansplained to her that more riders were now approaching, yet these were not bandits. They were white cloaks, about fifty of them. Nynaeve practically simpered to the leader as he rode up, calling him Captain, though she had absolutely no idea that he truly had the rank of lieutenant, and did her best not to make him look suspicious at them at all. Another soldier came and examined the casks in their wagon, casks that really did hold dyes, and Nynaeve asked that they let her open any of them they wished to examine. You see, the casks were sealed by wax to keep the contents inside safe on the long journey. The lieutenant asked after Chanchico, whether or not Andric still held to the throne, and if Amathera were still the Panarch. Nynaeve assured him that both were still there when she had left, which was the truth, even though she had no idea if they had been able to hold on to their country since then or not. When he asked about Aes Sedai stirring up all the trouble in the city, she told him, quote, Plain merchants don't mingle with that sort. End quote. Nynaeve asked only one question, about whether or not they were already in Amadicia. When he told them that they would cross the border in only five miles, Elaine started asking him about the border. And, of course, being Elaine, she sounded more like a queen making demands from a throne than any merchant girl. Nynaeve talked over her, apologizing for her niece, who thought far too much of herself and who couldn't stay away from the boys. Elaine's indignant gasp was genuine, and seemed convincing to the white cloak. So after being allowed to go on their way, Tom had to break up an argument between the two women as Julian tried to stay out and uninvolved. As soon as they were across the border and in the town of Mardesson, where the other three had to convince Nynaeve that they needed to stay and rest for at least a day or so. One cool thing I pulled out from this chapter is that, I mean, it was off screen or off page, but Nynaeve can, tr can control the weather. Which is really cool. We see that Elaine learns a little bit of the weather manipulation from some sea folk at some point. But um, right now, uh, Nynaeve is showing that off. We've known that she's had this weather sense of being able to listen to the wind for a long time. But not that she could just whip up a storm. So I thought that was such a cool thing and such a teaser for it not to be like shown to us a little more overtly. Right. Um, and uh, another just tiny detail is that her braid is back. Yes. And uh, we learn a little bit more <laughs> about the, and thus, of course, you know, the braid tugging is back. And so we learn more about the function of the braid tugging. Um, she thinks of it as an outlet for her anger so that she can keep from thumping Elaine. And I don't <laughs> think I've seen a previous mention that that's what her braid tugging is for, as this just physical outlet for anger. I mean, it makes intuitive sense, and maybe a lot of us had already been thinking about it in that way anyway. But it was just cool to see kind of the reason for that tick. Um, helps keep her hands occupied so she doesn't go wailing on anybody. Yes, yes. And, and I've always seen that as being tied to her moods 
you know, the, the braid tugging, she's aggravated. She's mm -hmm. um, annoyed, perhaps, sometimes angry. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on, but it, it's very much, you know, like a, a cat. And you see, you see that tail twitching. It's it's time to back off because the claws are about to come out. And that's exactly the way it is with Nynaeve Almira. When the, she starts tugging on that braid, that's your clue to back off and start being nice. And, and your answer to the question, whatever the question, is yes, ma'am. <laughs> Absolutely. Something else I noticed, too, is that, I mean, this is something to always keep our eyes on about uh, Nynaeve's change in sympathies when it comes to Aes Sedai, her change in feelings about... The White Tower, uh, and in this chapter, she has some sympathy for Aes Sedai manipulations of rulers, which mm. is uh, kind of a big step. So, you know, in our last book, in The Shadow Rising, it was Elaine who was the one who was so disgusted with Amathera, but Nynaeve has apparently now come around to that idea, to the fact that the woman needed to be taken down a peg, and she needed to understand the common people so that she could better serve them. So um, Nynaeve kept Amathera's jewelry as a reminder that, quote, even women who sat on thrones needed to be taken by the scruff of the neck and shaken, end quote. <laughs> um, and not only is that just kind of funny, but I think it also foreshadows her much later role with Rand when she helps to keep him grounded and remind him of where he came from, no matter how high he ends up rising once he starts taking all these thrones. Um, in this case, she's actually thinking more of Elaine needing to stay grounded uh -huh. as she's the royal that, that Nynaeve knows. Um, but it's cool that she really takes this kind of, she takes this mindset towards Rand and ends up being able to help him win the last battle with it, essentially. Right. And, you know, I'm I'm kind of kicking around the idea here. I may be wrong, but I'm, I'm mulling it over in my mind about uh, Nynaeve's moods. And part of it to me, it seems like at this point in the story, she is looking for things to get upset about. She's looking for things to uh, to get on her nerves, uh, looking for a reason to tug that braid. I'm wondering if part of that is more of a subconscious um, uh, expression of her desire to be able to access the, the true source, the, the one power. Now, she may not be needing to channel right then, but remember, because of her block, she can't even see the source or sense it. It's as if she mm, is a non-channeler yeah. at all until she's angry and that block is removed. So I'm wondering if she's trying to kind of keep things on a low simmer. Because to me, it feels like later in the story, she gets upset at times and she gives people a tongue lashing. But it's it's more of when they actually do deserve it and less or fewer times that than right now during this, this series, because I feel like she's she's always looking for a reason to be somewhat angry. Um, she even reflected on, on her anger with this, uh, you know, when she thought of how the dust storm, you know, she had whipped that up to get rid of those bandits, and it had gotten out of control, had gotten a lot bigger than she'd expected it to be. She was reflecting on how her power mm -hmm. had grown. and And then she gave this quote, her earlier anger was gone, but she was making fine for another crop, end quote. So she's put it in very agrarian terms, like you're raising a garden or raising a crop. But <laughs> yeah, she's, yeah. she's nursing a reason to be angry. Now, uh, the the bickering that goes on between she and, and Elaine here, um, I mean, part of that to me, I wanted to chalk that up to being Robert Jordan just loved to write female conflicts. Um, this seemed to be a, <laughs> yeah. a, a very common thing. And then I stopped and thought about it. Well, they've been traveling for a month now. I don't know of very many people who can take a, a two-day car ride without being at one another's throats, uh, you know, being confined <laughs> in a small yeah. space for a, a, a extended period of time. So, yeah, to have been traveling for a month, everybody is getting on everybody's nerves at this point. But I still think that Nynaeve is keeping some of this as I said before, simmering on the back burner, ready to to have a, a, the ability to reach the source in case she needs it. Um, but I'm not sure. I, I want to kind of look at that throughout the series and see if later, after the block is gone, if she is not a lot more chill until she feels like she has a real reason to be angry. Yeah. Um, and I think that was something I had noticed, too, that she... Um, she really was working, I love that wording, and working up another crop of anger. 
um, and that she's using that tool a lot more intentionally now and really, I guess, learning how to live with her block. Yes, yes. Um, something else I think she did in this chapter, too, is uh, she actually played a pretty convincing job of merchant. And again, we have where Elaine was the one who kind of blew the cover and she broke character and she kind of screwed up the situation in in this uh, yes, scenario. Yes. And in the palace, she didn't she didn't goof it that badly. She just kind of seemed condescending. But this time, she's talking back to a white cloak, like, "Oh, are you trying to move the border?" Like, no, you wouldn't be saying that to anybody like right. that, Elaine. You sound like a royal. You need to cool it. Um, and so I think you know, Nynaeve sometimes is unnecessarily antagonistic to Elaine. Um, as you said, who wouldn't be after? Uh, travel like this uh, so confined so much of the time if it's not in a boat which makes Nynaeve really sick it's uh, in a carriage where they're just stuck together Um, but despite all of that antagonism Nynaeve is right this time there was really no um, you know there was no need for Elaine to speak up like that but but she Nynaeve herself took it too far there was no need to add the stuff about the boys (laughs) (laughs) so that was a step too far oh yeah I agree that I mean she was just making up a story out of whole cloth and and threw in wow here's some very matt like details wasn't it you know matt could always throw in details to a backstory they were completely unnecessary but he had to throw it in anyway (laughs) and yeah she she did that very clearly here um and you know perhaps uh elaine did have a point that that nynaeve might have been simpering a little too much playing it a little too thick but uh, then again, I, I believe it was working. The, the white cloaks expect um, to receive respect from people. They don't often get it, but they feel like they're due that. And yeah. so, mm-hmm. you know, too much could right. have put them, you know, made them suspicious. But too little definitely makes them suspicious. And when you disrespect them. Yeah, I think if, yeah. if you're going to err on one side or the other, it should be on the side of being nicer to them. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I think it's just... You know, they seem like the kind of guys who really enjoy petty uses of their power. Exactly. And they would probably really just enjoy and see it, feel entitled to it as their due if somebody really kind of simpered to them. So I actually think that Nynaeve probably did the right thing. She might have come off a little bit suspicious, but they actually didn't seem that worried about her. They seemed like they were doing their normal, you know, kind of intimidation yeah. and... and you know, checking supplies and that kind of right. stuff. You know, one of them cuts the ropes to throw back the tech canvas to get the to the casks. Well, that was mm-hmm. unnecessary to cut the rope. You know, rope is right. expensive. It's hard to make unless you're in a highly industrialized world like we are today. But yeah, in places like this, that that's handmade rope, so it is it's difficult and mm-hmm. expensive. But then again, he did not break open the cask. But she was prepared, you know, he, you just choose the cask and let me open it, if you would. Uh, which sounded very reasonable and, you know, showed that they really had very little to hide. Um, you, know, you know, she did talk about being very aware of the rings on the chain around her neck. But, but they couldn't see that unless she undressed. So, hey, no big deal. Uh, but she was definitely <laughs> right. trying to play it cool. And, and that's, I guess, so against her nature, she had to lay it on a little thick. But I, I agree with you that that's the way to handle it with him. And I kept feeling like in, in this scene that there should have been some way to use the power to subtly influence a person's mind. And as far as I know, there's not. I mean, you know, you have compulsion, you have the water bond. Mm. But, you know, I, I kept wanting a an Obi-Wan Kenobi style thing of these are not the droids you're looking for move along you know and there's no way to do that with the one power there's there's you know or at least not that they're aware of um that who knows in the new age of legends that come up in the next age perhaps there will be ways to use it like that but right now there are no subtle manipulations of a person's thoughts it's more concrete things that you can see and and do but um, yeah, I kept expecting something like that. Even though I've been through this series a few times, I know that doesn't exist. But if I had been an author, it would have been a very difficult for me not to throw in something like that. Yeah. And plus, I really like that quote from Obi Wan in the original Star Wars. <laughs> I, I find <laughs> reasons to use that yeah. around the house and among friends. Well, I am pretty much out of 
notes for this chapter. Did you have anything else on chapter oh, eight? No, that's all I've got. Thank you. Uh, well, I will go ahead and move on to my summary of chapter nine, A Signal, which finds the party entering the village of Mardison and getting ready to camp for the night. Tom went to town and got food and supplies, and they all had some time to wash up for dinner. Nynaeve and Elaine needed to talk about topics that weren't fit for the men's ears, like the dust storm. They had no idea that was her. The Black Aja, the men knew, but it still made Julian uncomfortable. Mo Gideon and Teleron Riyadh, the latter of which they knew nothing about. While Julian pretended to sleep, and he did blow his cover by piping up to talk about how hot Amathera was when the women brought her up, Nynaeve and Elaine talked in code. Instead of Mo Gideon, they talked of Elaine's mother. Instead of Teleron Riyadh, they talked about their dreams and the strange feeling of being watched there. Nynaeve was pretty sure that the feeling of unseen eyes had nothing to do with Mo Gideon, though. The Forsaken had a very personal hatred of Nynaeve now, and if she had the opportunity to find Nynaeve so easily like that, surely she would have struck again, right? But Nynaeve decided they needed some privacy to talk a bit more freely with each other. They had a good reason for going to town, as Tom brought back a lot of preserved meats and very little produce. Were they going to give them all scurvy or something? I mean, come on. Men... So Elaine and Nynaeve went to check out the produce market in the village. It turns out that Tom might have actually looked for some vegetables. There was hardly anything besides some shriveled root vegetables, and almost none of the bounty that there should be at this point in the summer. Still, they got a few baskets of some leafy greens and radishes at least. But on their way back, Nynaeve noticed a signal in the window of a dress shop. The bundle of herbs hanging in the window was perfectly arranged to be a yellow aja emer emergency signal. The shop must have been a front for Aes Sedai eyes and ears, as it looked like the business wasn't patronized often. They saw no one come and go, and the dresses inside had dust on them. The women working there, Mistress Makira and her assistant Lucy, looked surprised when they walked in, introducing themselves and asking for the urgent message. The seamstress seemed nervous the whole time, and was being cagey about the message. Was it that bad? She ordered Lucy to make her best tea from the blue canister, and Elaine suggested they could speak with more privacy in the kitchen. As they sat down for the tea, which Mistress Macker herself seemed too nervous to touch just yet, she delivered the message, quote, All sisters are welcome to return to the White Tower. The tower must be whole and strong, end quote. Was that all? Okay. But as Nynaeve asked for some follow-up information, the rest of the message or something, she started to feel extremely fatigued and noticed Elaine's head was already on the table. Nynaeve's tongue was thick as she protested, but she found herself slipping out of consciousness also. What was in that tea? And thus ends Chapter 9, A Signal. Nynaeve here, I, I see this as sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. She expected before Tom ever went to town that all he was going to come back with is meat and beans, because that's how men are. <laughs> and surprise, <laughs> she saw exactly what she expected to see. Um, and... Uh, you know, she did. She did, would not accept the fact that maybe there wasn't a lot of food there to be bought. First of all, and second of all, when mm -hmm. you're traveling, uh, dried beans and salt cured meats are you know there's something that keep very well for a long journey. So, you know, he really didn't do a bad job, but she was going to be dissatisfied with it no matter what because I think she had made up her mind to be dissatisfied with whatever he brought back. Um, but, you know, I never even thought about due to the war and the floundering trade that there might not be a lot of things here, uh, you know, to buy and sell yeah. because you, you still have a lot of people in the farms and they're raising what they need and they sell some excess food, but not much. And of course, with the strange weather that they had leading up to some of these years, you know, where the winters were extended and springs would come late that it, I think a lot of the crops were um, very poor and a lot of the harvests were poor and mm. of course all the wars and lack of trade really really makes things like that worse so uh, yeah, she didn't stop and think about those things at all but focus on the one thing she expected to see and you know we've said it before if if all you if the only tool you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail if if all you want to yeah. do is is to chew people out for doing a bad job you'll find a bad job somewhere and, uh, yeah, so she saw pretty much what she expected to see instead of listening. Um, and I, I, when they decided to go into town, she and Elaine, and they wanted some time to talk. And I think that was as, as much the excuse to go to town as anything. And Elaine caught on to that, which was pretty cool. 
um, you know, Julian starts to flip a coin to see whether he or Tom gets to go with him, and she stops him right there. Nope, nope, no sense in you guys tagging along. We don't need you here. I see part of that decision, again, being their need to talk or their desire to talk privately, as, as people should be able to do occasionally. But also, I see that as, um, uh, I guess, some hubris on her part, pride. She had driven off bandits with the one power. She had faced off one of the forsaken with her power. Uh, nobody could really do anything to Nynaeve that she couldn't stop them with, right? I mean, they're, just, they're not going to walk into a situation in a little town like Mardison and, and come upon something that they can't handle with the power, right? And she forgets the one power at this point is not the answer to every question or every problem. Uh, you know, there, yeah. There's a reason, Nynaeve, that many Aes Sedai have warders because there are, there are some things the power yeah. makes you susceptible to. Now, of course, obviously they don't know about Fork Root at this time. Rhonda Mercuria seems to be the only woman in all of Randland that knows about it uh, at this point yeah. in the story. But... Still, you, you should expect that there are things that cannot be done with the power. There are situations where the one power becomes useless to you if you've been shielded or, you know, you you walk into a um, an Ogier, uh, I keep wanting to say Ogier Grove. Um, oh, Steading. Steading. I you. almost said Grove, too. <laughs> my, my brain just completely <laughs> locked up on me with that one. Yeah, you walk into an Ogier Steading. There, there are times and places that the one power is completely useless to you. And, of course, they find one of those other situations where it becomes completely useless. And, in fact, a, a, a deficit. This is the fork root. It doesn't affect anyone who cannot channel. But women who can channel, yes, it, they find out their powers are not worth much against against this root. So, um, I, I, I kind of see that, again, as, as hubris and pride. She doesn't think there's anything that she cannot handle right now. And you feel that way after having some successes, after you've done well and and you're beginning to be recognized for, you know, your your power and the things that you can do, your skills. Um, but, yeah, it's it's very normal and very natural to, to step out a little too far and extend yourself and get in a, a bad situation. Well, since you were talking about uh, Rhonda Macura and... Um fork root and everything it just got me wondering and i don't even have this in my notes i just thought about it i wonder if there's some weaves you could use to sort of do like a delving equivalent to food or drink to try and detect poisons or something oh. before you partake of them yeah um i imagine there's got to be some kind of something like that in the age of legends whether maybe they used standing flows uh to create terra hungry all that just regular people could use kind of test their food right, right. um for you know for who knows what lead or anything yes. um but i don't know if, if they even had something like that would it pick up on an herb nobody's ever seen before right it would probably not you think it would uh, have to it, be it really just depends yeah you think it would have to be keyed to that in some way you know, some way to recognize yeah. it, to single that out. But that is a good idea, something to think of for the the new Age of Legends that will come. Um, yeah. yeah. Is there a way to detect that? Or, or like you said, even regular poisons that would kill someone over time or within a matter of hours. Uh, a You know, we see that a channeler is susceptible to these things just as anyone else would be. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, poisons... Poisons kill indiscriminately. So, yeah, that's interesting. I yeah. never thought about that, that there would be a, a way to to learn to detect things like that. That that would make a, a good element in the story if someone came up with that. Um, yeah, fork root is... Yeah, oh, go and, ahead. Oh, yeah, no, go no, ahead. I was going to say, fork root is one of those things in the story that once Robert Jordan thought of it, it became a a continuing element in the story. Um, it's like at this point, no one has ever heard of it. No one in the tower knows anything about it. And you'd think some brown sister would have come across something in a book somewhere or in some field study somewhere about fork root and its effects on Chandler's. But if they ever did, they never thought it was important enough to share. And so suddenly this dressmaker in a 
obscure town at the edge of nowhere, you know, knows about Forker, uses it against them, and suddenly there are bales and barrels of this stuff all over the place. Every bad guy has them. The Sian Shan have it, have access to warehouses full of it during a time when people can't even harvest enough food. So, yeah, it, it almost, I don't know, the stuff may have been the equivalent of kudzu today. It grows all out of control. And you find it, you find it all over Randland. Could be. Um, so. It could be something that people never uh, thought to find a use for. Right. And it was just everywhere. I don't, I don't really yeah. know. Well, they certainly found a lot of people to harvest it at certain points in the story. When yeah, it became it convenient for the story. Somewhere story that labor happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of people. Um, so anyway, I just, I thought that was kind of funny. Um, what is your thoughts on this? Was Nynaeve too trusting of Rhonda Makura, and why? Yeah, I think she she was, um, and I think it's just an unfortunate artifact of her gaining more sympathy towards Aes Sedai. She's coming to trust the White Tower to begin to loosely identify with it. She's coming to understand the Aes Sedai point of view about things she used to be extremely suspicious, like manipulating rulers like we saw in the last chapter yes. um so she's coming to to she's coming around to thinking about them as us you know she's right. thinking of her as one of them especially since she has been able to talk to yellow aja members enough to be in on their signals uh which i thought was a little strange like seemed a little too convenient i guess for the yeah. story like when did any of these conversations happen why would they be sharing <laughs> yes. that kind of stuff with her she wasn't but, in the um, tower very long she's a field agent more than right? anything else <laughs> yeah but um you know what it's canon it must have happened at some point he says it did so we just got to go with it um yeah i just think uh this sympathy she has with Aes Sedai really got taken advantage of here. The suspicion that she used to have would really have helped her here. <laughs> so she, it, it seemed like character development that she was becoming more sympathetic to Aes Sedai. And it is, in a way, because it was helping her learn to develop her channeling abilities. But her previous skepticism really would have served her here. Um She's not wrong to be wary of Aes Sedai. I've brought that up in previous episodes. Swan said to her face, "Life, your life would be a cheap price to pay to prevent mm. the Black Aja from getting their hands on Kalimdor. Right. So, um, you know, time away from the tower with autonomy and kind of gaining the respect of an Aes Sedai and people treating her that way, I think has her forgetting just how controlling Aes Sedai are. Right. Right. Um, so she's really lost the caution I think she should yeah. have had. And like you said, she has definitely gone from thinking of the Aes Sedai from being them to being us. She has included herself in that group. And, and part of that's because she's taken time to, you know, to eat from that table, so to speak. She has uh, take, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. seen what it is like to at least pose as an Aes Sedai. Um, to mm -hmm. manipulate rulers when they needed to be manipulated, to do good things, uh, you know, of course, hunting down the Black Aja and trying to kill one of the Forsaken is a pretty good thing, although I know a lot of things were destroyed in the doing of that. Still, uh, yeah, she's she's moved from from having that otherness to being a togetherness, in her mind at least, uh, even though... The full sisters do not accept her as a full sister. They're not going to uh, until, you know, she's sworn on the oath rod because there, there's much to being an Aes Sedai other than being able to use the power and claim that you're Aes Sedai. But, uh, but she's well on her way you know, toward getting there, and but she just hasn't fully understood that yet. But you're right. She's drank from that cup. It's, it's a good feeling. It's a... I guess a feeling of, of power and respect, which is something that, in a sense, Nynaeve has craved. Um, you know, she had respect yeah. from her father, mm -hmm. and uh, you know he, he taught her very many things, taught her to be somewhat of a tomboy or to be able to take care of herself, at least, which is important. And she fought to get the respect of the women's council and the, the men's council there in, in Emmons Field. And now she's she's finding basically new levels of that. But respect has been something she has had to strive for since the passing of her father. And so she's striving for that and mm -hmm. working for that because that is the 
her drug of choice, just for people to respect her for who she is and what she's done. And and she, unfortunately, feels like she has to earn that over and over. Um, and, and when she does, then, again, that becomes a weak point for her. That becomes a uh, her Achilles heel because it causes her to step out and do things that normally she wouldn't do. And, and as a cautious person, yeah, she I don't think she would normally would have just trusted a stranger. But here it made her feel like she's one of the gang. She's She gets to sit at the table with the cool kids too because she knows the sign. And, and well, this is someone who works with the, with the Yalo Aja, so I can just walk in and appear like I'm one of the Yalo Aja. Um, it had to be a big surprise to Ronda Mikura to have these girls she was told to look out for and walk right into her shop and start talking to her. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you talk about a, a a person who really thinks they just hit the lottery. I mean, she does. She cannot imagine her surprise. And she masks that very poorly. But again, because Nynaeve wants to be so trusting, wants to be that, with that in crowd and pose as an Aes Sedai, that she she does not pick up on those clues. She doesn't she doesn't see it. Yep. I think you're absolutely right that that uh, seeking approval and respect, uh, some modicum of power and the benefits she's been getting as I said, I really influenced her here. So not only kind of gaining sympathy with their point of view, but I really liked how you put it as like a taste of, of that power of how you can get treated right. as one. Uh, yeah, she's, she's gotten the taste of the one power, but now the, the influence and the power that comes with that among people. Yes. Um, and then we get to the part of the story that is so unrealistic that it's hard for me to to hang with it. And and I'll set that up by saying this: Uh-oh. as an older man who is great at giving advice, is great with people, who loves to juggle, I do not have young blonde-haired girls throwing themselves at me. So, <laughs> <laughs> Uh-huh. Okay. A very poor setup, I know, but no, I don't think it's it's a bad part of the story. I'm just trying to be funny. Uh, but Nynaeve is very focused on Elaine's reactions to Tom. Now, we all know that right mm-hmm. now uh, Elaine has remembered who Tom is to her or was to her when she was an infant. Um, she is a young girl that kind of grew up with some daddy issues because he was absent because he died Mm -hmm. and of course we know tom probably killed him but uh, that's not she doesn't know that part so she's cool with that yeah um but she doesn't really see tom as a love interest but that's how naive perceives it and that may even be uh i don't know elaine may be really flirting with him and not not aware of that i don't think she's romantically interested in tom at all I think she just craves his time and attention. She is she's seeing a yeah. father figure. She likes the attention she gets yes, from him. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. She's she's craving that father figure. She sees that in him, and and I think it's probably good for her. Now, again, if she's you know a little too gushy and everything, um, I don't know. Yeah, I guess you got to portray it somehow in the story. Um, but yeah, she's definitely showing him more attention than she normally would. She acts differently around him. And, and again, that's understandable. And I don't really have a problem with that part of the story. But again, we come to the, such a huge lack of communication here. When they're walking into town, uh, uh, Nynaeve and, and Elaine, and you know, Elaine, of course, she's very astute. She understands Nynaeve just wants to talk to her alone more than, than she wants produce. So, yeah, she starts, what do you want to talk about, Mogadine? You know, and, and starts throwing out these things. And so Nani tells her, well, you know, you're you're really, um, you're coming on too strong to Tom. In fact, at one point, I can't remember <laughs> where it was exactly, she even basically called her a twitch skirt or, or used the term twitch skirt, which I, th- I thought was a little over uh-huh. the line. But that was <laughs> yeah. that, that was the term she either thought or said, and I don't recall. I couldn't find it. Looking back, she might have this. thought it because she's doing a pretty good job of holding back all the harsher things yes. she wants right. to say. Right. <laughs> she's doing a really good job of uh, talking pretty right. 
delicately and carefully to her. Uh, even the insults. Yes. It's like, your pretty skin isn't going to appreciate the sun, right. Elaine. Right. You should put your hat on. <laughs> yes. you know, when she really wants to say it a lot right. on her. Yes. Um, I don't want you looking like a freaking lobster, <laughs> like put on your hat or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think she knows what a right. lobster is, but you, yeah. you get she, my idea. She was not um, going to try to heal her of sunburn if she got one. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and she's really about to burst because she's really so used to brow beating, but she has, she's learned that that doesn't, it's not very effective. And she recognizes that she has been unfair to right, Elaine before. Right. So I like that she's trying so hard to be tactful yes, yes, here, um, in that conversation and in, in, in the conversation about right. Tom. Yeah, sure. you're right. She's trying to be tactful. She's, she's hinting when she needs to hint and she's saying what she needs to say, but in a nice way. But Elaine never says well, I look up to him, or I like spending time with him, or, you know, I have these memories of him. He was around when I was a baby. You know, those, that mm -hmm. would have made sense, and I think Nani would have put that together. <laughs> yeah. But we have the wheel of non-communication, and she can't say that. Mm -hmm. What does she do? She says, well, I do love Rand, but he's so far away. And it makes it sound like she is throwing herself at Tom. That she is romantically or yeah, sexually interested in him. It sounds sketchy. Yeah. And now part of it could be that she's she's just a young woman and you know would have normal sexual urges. And here's a guy that's around, you know, that she admires. And so maybe maybe her actions are going over the line a little bit, or maybe naive is just seeing that or thinking that things are, you know. Mm -hmm. Elaine is throwing herself at him too much when really all Elaine wants is attention. But Elaine's reaction to Nynaeve's questions are what just really just blows my mind. At no point does she say, well, I don't, I don't care for him like that. This is just fun to, you know, he's fun to talk to and, you know, and I love being around him and I have these memories of him from when I was a baby. But none of that. Well, I do love Rand, but he's so far away. <laughs> that makes it sound like she wants, <laughs> that she is interested in him. Um, and I don't think she is, but th there's something in there. At some point, I felt like she should have said something different. But then again, I've walked away from half the conversations in my life wishing I had said something differently, too. So perhaps that makes it more realistic yeah. that Elaine doesn't say, you know, come right out and say what she needs to hear. I don't know that that one is just it's a struggle for me to to not reach over and it really reach is. into the page and grab Elaine and shake her until her teeth rattles. <laughs> well, and even Tom seems to indulge it. It's like, come on, you ought to know yeah. better. You ought to be the one who's able to create a little distance here. Right. You should be the more responsible party. Exactly. Yeah, just just to um, say, well, oh, I love being around your child, but you're you're acting like a little girl right now. You know, act more like a woman. Yeah, yeah. something he he could have found some way. Uh, I guess he was eating up the attention too, or yeah, I was about to say, yeah, or perhaps naive is just an unreliable narrator here. Perhaps Elaine mm. is not throwing herself at him that much, and Tom is not indulging her too much, but instead maybe naive is seeing this and expanding it in her imagination to be a lot bigger deal yeah. than it is. I don't know. She does have a pretty puritanical sense of propriety around sex and relationships. <laughs> yes. So it wouldn't surprise me if she was seeing a lot of things as improper that probably right. wouldn't shock us or most of our listeners right. <laughs> or that we might not right. think is inappropriate. Just oh. signs of friendliness or affection yeah. in general um, might be putting Nynaeve off. And especially because she is upset that she can't be around Lan. So right. she's she might see any kind of closeness or affection even if it's not romantic as something that irritates her and she's not willing to acknowledge uh, that she's sort of envious that other people get to you know be close to somebody yeah. right now I at don't know. some point she even alludes to this slightly when she says you know she never even really mm. looked at a man until land men drag her and and so mm -hmm. she's at least you know comparing how how she acted around men to how elaine is acting and i think that missing land and that very strong attraction she has for him that is is blossoming into love, I think that is a big driver for this, a big driving force behind the way she, she looks at this. But interestingly, um, one thing that I, I noticed in this chapter I don't remember ever seeing anywhere else when Nynaeve thinks about Tom is she thinks about wanting to heal his leg when she sees him limp mm. from the injury from the murder yes. all. But... Um, 
And so, I mean, now it this not only speaks to Nynaeve having compassion for somebody deep inside that she normally seems to have antagonism towards hourly, right. <laughs> um, which is pretty common for her. I think it also shows a, a shift, the shift that's been happening in how she thinks about the one power. She's now thinking about wanting to do impossible healing feats with it, whereas before it was more of, you know, ways to get back at Moraine or whatever. Now that she's gaining a little more sympathy to the Aes Sedai point of view and she's growing in her ability to use Sidar, she wants to do things that people say you can't do with it. Right. It foreshadows her assistance to Rand. She wants to heal the wound in his side. I don't think she actually ends up no. ever doing that, but no, she, she does heal his madness. She heals that of many other male channelers. Yes. She heals... Uh, stilling and gentling she heals she cleanses the taint right. and basically heals the one power itself right. um and so uh she ends up doing a lot of these impossible feats and right now she's already thinking about that we see that determination her inability to just accept that those are the limitations well, oh yes um and she thinks too that when she's thinking about moraine and stuff she's thinking well you know, a lot of things have changed since since then. The world seems to have changed since Moraine came to our village. But maybe it's me who's changed. No, 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 no. It's definitely the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, she's, she doesn't go quite far enough in acknowledging that she has been developing quite a right, lot. Right, right. And I do like these inner monologues a lot of our characters have where they will start to analyze their own uh, reasons for doing things and then back off away from it. And I find that so hilarious. It's a it's a great writing style and it really makes these characters seem a lot more realistic to me when when they start questioning their own motives and then they just throw it away. Nah, it's not that. But they just you know the, yeah. the author just made it very clear to the reader what you know the characters' motives are. Uh, so I, I I do I do love the fact you see that with most of these characters at one point or another. Uh, but yeah, I, I like that, uh, this being a foreshadowing, which I had not thought of and not contrasted it that way. Um, and really, for, you know, from her perspective, why shouldn't you be able to heal this or that, or, you know, Tom's leg or any yeah. other thing? Um, you know, why accept these limitations that other people put on you? Uh, that's really, a, I guess, in, a, in one sense, a great attitude to have because people who have mm -hmm. broken barriers whether it's something if like physical in athletics, you know, when people said you could never break the five minute mile and now that's very commonplace, whether it is breaking racial barriers or gender barriers or whatever, when when other people arbitrarily set a limit and say, We cannot go beyond this, we cannot change this well, it's not a bad thing to stop and ask why. Why can we not exceed this? Why can we not break that barrier? Some barriers don't need to be broken, uh, you know, because some idiot bored into the, the dark one's prison, you know. So some barriers do not need to be broken, but some do. And you don't know until you question why. Why can we not do what you say can't be done? Uh, because at one time they thought no one could fly. And then, you know, people built Joe cars and J-wings. I mean, it happens. They, <laughs> exactly. they break those barriers. So um, this is one, like you said, I hadn't really thought of that, but this is part of that genesis in her mind of, uh, you know, why, why can't that be healed? Why that, can't that be done? Now, I guess from a very a technical perspective, I have wondered what happened to Tom in that fight that caused the limp. At first, I had just taken it that he'd taken mm -hmm. a sword stab or something, you know, couldn't couldn't avoid. But the Murdral would have had a Thakandar blade, and Tom would not have survived that. So I, then I got to wondering later, maybe is it is it a torn ligament in a knee, something that just can't heal on its own? Was it a you know a, a broken mm. bone that that healed mis in a misaligned way? We, we don't really know what caused yeah. the limp. We just know he has pain from it. And Warren eased his pain there in the Stone of Tear, of course, unasked for, but but it didn't get rid of it. It wasn't gone. She just eased it somewhat, you know, in a temporary fashion. But uh, so there are there are some things that you know they acknowledge they can do with the power. But I guess until you understand technically what happened to cause his limp, there's not a way to you know to cure that or fix that. But it wouldn't surprise me if Nynaeve didn't one day break his leg and reheal it back just to 
right? <laughs> just to get it where it needs to be yeah. and, and have him walk without a limp. Um, I, I don't, yeah, you know, we know there are some things that can't be healed. You know, old age, life can be extended, but it can't go on indefinitely. But there, there are very few limits, I think, when people can work together in a responsible way using whatever power they have, whether it's today's, you know, technical, uh, medical innovation or whether it's in the Rand land in the use of the one power. Yeah, I think there, there needs to be uh, people who question, you know, why do we have to stop here? Why can't we do more and, and give people a better life? And I think we can do that. So, yeah, I, I like her attitude anyway. Yeah. And I would apologize for that, but we had not gotten off topic today. We had to at some point. So I did my best to derail <laughs> us did. and bring us back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Well, I think that's all I've got from this one. Um, yeah, same. Except that, I, I don't know. There should have been... You know, that, that moment when Elaine is falling asleep at the table, that she just kind of turns her head and raises one eyebrow before she snores, says, I told you so, or something. Somebody, somebody needs to, <laughs> yeah. needs to remind Nynaeve that, you know, we, we, we should have brought the guys. We, we shouldn't do this stuff alone. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe even throw in a little humorous something in the show with that, similar to that. But, uh, yeah, I... We, I don't know. I guess we took a couple of chapters that had very little action and wrung everything we could out of them today, though. So, mm -hmm. Well, I hope all of our listeners will join us next time for Season 3, Episode 8, when we're going to cover The Fires of Heaven, Chapters 14 and 15. Wheel of Mind is written by Lajara and Giskel and produced by me, Lajara. Our original theme music was composed by Wendigo. You can find his new Layers EP on SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube, and those links will be in the description. There are neither beginnings nor endings to the turning of the Wheel of Mind, but this is an ending. To catch a beginning next time an episode drops, subscribe to Wheel of Mind on Podbean, Stitcher, iTunes, or Spotify. You can also find our episodes on YouTube under the channel name Lajara Dane. That's L-A-J-A-R-A-D-A-Y-N-E. To leave feedback, rate and review on whichever platform you use to listen to us, or contact us at lajaradane at gmail.com or at mind underscore wheel on Twitter. To support the show, subscribe to us on Patreon by visiting patreon.com slash wheel of mind. Um, so, listeners, if anybody, if I end up putting any of this in there, if you would like to adopt a really sweet, petite adult cat, who doesn't, she's spayed, she's vaccinated, she pretty much only wants to just rub her head on you, um, let me know. Preferably if you're in the Southwest United States, but who knows, we might be able to make other arrangements if you super want this cat, let me know. <laughs> we, we can even give her a Wheel of Time name if you like. Yeah, I mean, oh, of course. I mean, you know, adopters always rename them, so you can come up with something cute. She's a tortoise shell, so she's got the black and white colors all, or the black and orange colors kind of mixed together, so if, if anything speaks to you about that. Um, go for it. 